now we be going to the portion of the song before the lesson today. The lesson today is being given by Brother Sanders. I mean, not Brother Sanders, but Brother Gibbons. He'll be preaching this morning, Married to Whom? Married to Whom is the title of the lesson. He came to me quite some time ago to, to fill into the spot to take this part of the service this morning to preach. I always give a young man a time for him to preach the gospel. The naked truth, I always say. Be able to tell what God says and not what men say. As we continue on, we'll be singing a song, and the next voice you'll be hearing is Brother Daryl Gibbons provokes the number one in the house of uh, the Lord. Uh, the song before the lesson, it won't be, it won't it be wonderful today. 877 is a song for the song. 877. Mark the song of song after the lesson. I'll be listening. We sing that one and three on the invite invitation song. Song before the message. My brother here to do a good job. Stand before us and proclaim God's word. Won't it be wonderful there? You know it will. <clears throat> when with the Savior will enter the glory land, won't it wonderful there. Ended the troubles and cares of the story land. Won't it be wonderful there? Oh, won't it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear. Joyously singing with heart bells are ringing. Oh, won't it be wonderful Walking and talking with Christ the supernal one, won't it be wonderful there? Praising, adoring the matchless eternal one, won't it be wonderful there? Oh, won't it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear, joyously sing. text starts um, Matthew 22. I'm going to read verses 1 through 14 as quickly as I can. Um, but the title of the lesson is uh, Married to Whom? And um, 
I, I like to pick um, titles, forgive me, that where I focus on, there's a point that I want to bring out. Um, even with um, our beautiful saints that's here, and our handsome saint, our handsome uh, minister here, even that we have saints in here that is not married um, physically, um, but in a spiritual sense, they are married. And I want this lesson to focus on how to really have a godly marriage, uh, my perspective, um, just reading the words uh, off the pages of inspiration, um, things that could really help your marriage, even things that I still practice today, um, as I seek counsel from Brother Pope before, and I'm not afraid to be able to get counsel again if I fall or stumble, if me and Sister Gibbons are not on the same page, uh, we'll you know, reach out to Brother Pope. But a lot of times, as saints of God, uh, there comes a point in our marriage where we, uh, what I believe personally, and this is my personal belief, I don't want to put my beliefs on anybody else, but I believe there comes a point in your lifetime when you always should reflect on what God has done for us to be able to lead a godly marriage, to be able to counsel yourselves at some point. So mm -hmm. a lot of things shouldn't be a reoccurring events in a marriage. Mm -hmm. So married to whom? Matthew 22 and the verses is... 1 through 14. And by the way, I'm, I'm truly excited because my nephews are here. Um, mm -hmm. My nephews are here. Um, they're a young man that uh, I know I have a, a great deal of influence on. So for them to see me, um, you know, stand before them to be able to teach and um, preach things that they might, their young minds might not understand at this particular time, but they would be able to reference it like, oh, my uncle does that, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, my sons, I'm Lord said the same, I'm in my son's life, so my sons, they know, especially King, they know we have a church. He's like, don't ask him no stupid question like that. <laughs> Y'all know we have a church on Sunday, so King, he knows. Kyrie loves church, but um, Matthew 22, All right. in the verses 1 through 14. Married to whom? It says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and send forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the marriage, the wedding, forgive me. It says, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth servants, saying, tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and have killed my farthings, I mean, and, oh, forgive me, and my oxen, and my farthings are killed, and all the things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways. One to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But the king heard thereof and was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. And said unto his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. He says, Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants sent out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Hmm. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how comest thou in here, hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then, then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him out, cast him into outer darkness. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Mm -hmm. Amen, Saint Samuel. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to do and starting off by reading that is to show the saints, saints of God that are bidden to the marriage, that there's things in this world that the world will try to get you observed about a marriage. And we know that the world um, does things that, that we don't do things. You know, the world's precepts are not like our precepts on marriage. So there's three focal points I wanna focus on today and then I'm gonna have my seat. So I wanna focus on love and commitment. I'm gonna combine them two together. Love and commitment, forgiveness, 
and intimacy. Now there's a lot of different types of things, like I said, the world interpretation of marriage would say, oh, well, you gotta throw trust in there, and you gotta throw honesty in there, but I'm just gonna keep it simple. If you focus on these three, well, four and a half, because love and commitment I'm doing together. If you focus on these three, love, commitment, forgiveness, and intimacy, is a recipe for a perfect marriage. Not by my sayings, but the scriptures sayings, and I'm gonna prove that today. And we know in De Deuteronomy 24, it speaks about divorce. And I want to touch on divorce real quick before we go into the meat and potatoes of our lesson. Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 reads, it says, When a man had taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she found no favor in his eyes, because he had found some uncleanness in her, then... Let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it to her in her hand and send her out his house. As we know in Malachi 2.16, we know that the Lord hates divorce. But I want to give you an illustration of what divorcing is in my eyesight. So we talk about divorcement and to have a divorce a divorcement is a separation. A divorcement is without. A divorcement is actually without trusting God as well. So when us saints of God, when we are bid to a marriage and we are unworthy, it isn't that God is divorcing us. No, we separate ourselves from God. Adam and Eve divorced God. So the reason why God hates divorce is because it's a separation from him. And as saints, we should look at that same, we should apply those same principles in our lifetimes when we're dealing with things in our marriage physically. Even, even in the spiritual sense, the saints that's here that's not married. When we're doing things contrary to the will of God, we're separating ourselves from the husband. Mm -hmm. We know in Proverbs 6.16, Proverbs 6.16, let me go there. Proverbs 6.16, I'm going to start at verse 16. It says, These six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination. It says, a proud look. Now, in any, in any marriage, a proud look. Somebody can't be told something. It says, a lying tongue. You just can't stop telling tales, as I like to say. It says, enhance that shed innocent blood. It says, a heart that devise wicked imaginations. Now, these are not recipes for a healthy marriage. It says, feet that be swift to run into mischief, a false witness lying again, that speaketh lies. And he that saw a discourse among brethren, you're just a busybody, you're just telling people business all the time. These things is Lord, he hates these things. And whenever you're seeking a divorce, is because somewhere in your path, somebody started doing these six things, seven, which would be an abomination that the Lord hates. That's why people seek divorce. And except to be for fornication, which we know the God does see that as, okay, well, you're just going to be wicked. But the Bible also tells us that he knows the sheep. So anytime we are facing our tests and trials in our marriages, and we are to the point where it's just not going to work out. We need to stop and remind ourselves, well, who's being contrary to the will of God? Mm -hmm. That's why it's always important for um, saints that's in, in Christ when they are experiencing trouble in their marriages to open up the Bible. Because instead of finger pointing and doing things that uh, I don't like, she don't like, I'm going to tell you, I see Sister Gibbons hates when I leave dishwater in the sink. Mm -hmm. Oh, she hates that. Mm -hmm. You know, she worked with me, she has patience with me in dealing with that issue, but she hates it. But when I do things like that, Sister Gibbons is very upset. Instead of doing the finger point in our marriages, what we need to look at is that, okay, is it to the point where we cannot open up the Bible with anything that we're doing? Like I said, we're going to deal with love and commitment, forgiveness and intimacy. We're not going to deal with lying because in those, these three and a half, 
is going to show us other behavior patterns that we tend to take on when we are operating outside the boundaries of Christ. All right, so we're going to deal with love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'm going to start at verse number 1. And the Apostle Paul says, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, if I don't have love, charity is an affection, it's a benevolence. So Paul is saying, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, it says, I become as a sounding brass or a tinkle of cymbal. So if I don't address people with love, and I don't say the things uh, with grace in my heart, when I'm talking to you, nobody's going to be turned on about having a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody approached you rudely, the first thing you're going to be thinking about is like, oh, no, nah, I, I don't like the way you approach me. So you're not going to hear anything else that comes out of their mouth after that point because they just approached you so rudely. I'm going to go to verse 3. It says, and though I bestow all my goods and feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profit me nothing. In this verse, my interpretation of what the Apostle Paul is saying is this. You can feed people. You can be with your wife for 25 years. And I'm just saying it's not, not reference to the Samuels. I know y'all have been like 25 years. So. 25 years, I just like that number for some reason when I say marriage. But it says that you could be for somebody for 30 years. You could be for somebody for six years, the Lord said the same, and Sister Gibbons. And you have been with that person, and that person will like a particular thing before they go to work. Me, I I am one who loves to clean the kitchen a, a lot. My wife does a lot of kitchen. I, I love cleaning the kitchen. She does a lot of cooking, forgive me. I love to clean the kitchen because it helps my wife out. It helps my wife put the children down. It helps my wife to do other things that she wants to do. You know, my wife likes to read. She might want to read before she go to bed. So I love cleaning the kitchen. That's why I always get in trouble about leaving the dishwater there when she wakes up. <laughs> so it's saying like what the Apostle Paul is saying is that although we existed with each other for so many years, if nothing that we do is in love, then it's, it's voided, and we can do it to the day we die. If my wife doesn't like making me sandwiches before I go to work, she doesn't like packing my, if she doesn't pack my lunch box in order, uh, or say like, it, I don't have no particular order, but if my, I, I like to have my lunch packed before I go to work, I'm just saying, I'm using this as an example. And my wife is like, ah, oh, I've been doing this for years. Then it, it doesn't mean anything, it's jaded. Because if my wife doesn't like packing my lunch, or I don't like washing the dishes so that my wife can put the kids down, we're just existing together. And the Apostle Paul said, it doesn't matter. And you can do it till you die. You're just existing with each other because if there's no charity in it, then there is no real result from it. Like, if you had a, a significant other that went to work at 5 in the morning and they like breakfast cooked at 5 in the morning, you should be happy as a wife or a husband to get up at 5 in the morning and cook breakfast. Like, you should love to do it. Because the Apostle Paul says that even though you give your body to be burnt and you bestow all your goods and feed the poor, it says, and you don't have love doing what you do, it, it profit me nothing. And I want to jump to verse 7. It says, bearing in all things, believing in all things, and hoping in all things, enduring in all things. Verse number eight is very important. Charity never fails. Love never fails. So anything that I do for my wife, my wife has got a brand new car by the grace of God. Praise the Lord. And mm -hmm. God has been truly, truly good with us in that. Um, it was a lot of long suffering. That love was long suffering. We saw God for everything that we needed to have done in our marriage. And God has delivered. Like I said, even God made a way for us to have bath thanks to the Johnsons. And we didn't have water, but God made a way. He made a way. It says, charity never fail. It says, whether they be prophecy, that shall fail. It says, whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall vanish away. It shall vanish away. Now, prophecies fail because we have everything in the holy writ of God that we will need. There is nothing that anybody can tell us right to this day can prophesy about things that's going to pass that the Bible doesn't already say. So we don't need prophecy anymore. Tongues, we don't need those anymore. Tongues were a sign 
for the unbelievers, as 1 Corinthians, I believe, was chapter 14 tells us that we don't need anybody to speak in tongues. And the knowledge is not the knowledge that we have to love one another, the knowledge to be in Christ. It's that the knowledge that if somebody dropped dead in here, I wouldn't know how to resuscitate them unless I had some type of medical or if somebody, God forbid, passed away, I couldn't revive them like the Apostle Paul did. He brought somebody back from the dead. Uh, uh, Peter brought somebody back. I don't possess that knowledge. When Paul laid on the, the young fellow's head that fell from the third floor in Acts, when he fell from the third floor, Paul knew to go lay his body on top of that young man's body. So we don't possess that knowledge. Um, God doesn't talk to us to give us that knowledge no more, so we don't possess it. Verse 13, I'm going to jump down to verse 13. Now by faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. The greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is affection. It's your benevolence. It's the things that we do that makes us so happy to do. Like I brought up my wife's car and I did it for a reason. It's a brand new car. Uh, we didn't have time to get the car detailed and I spent a lot of work doing it, detailing it myself uh, on Saturday. And I get in a car and it's like chips everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but as a husband, I have to love to keep my wife's car clean. You know, I have to love to do it. I might fuss with her and be like, babe, I told you to don't let the children eat chips in the car. You know, but I get out there and love and clean my wife's car. And I do it. And, and Sister Gillis will tell you, I do it time and time again. And I fuss at her in the beginning because I'm like, babe, I'm going to constantly keep cleaning your car if you just constantly letting them eat in it. So. But it's still in love. It's not grievous, you know. It's not like, oh, I ain't cleaning it no more. I never do that. <laughs> no, I still do it. Amen. But uh, we want to go to Ephesians. We still want to display love. Again, in displaying love and displaying these basic, like I said, these basic elements that I want to talk about, we don't have to worry about trust. We don't have to worry about honesty because in these um, basic traits that I'm portraying and the Holy Red of God, will show you that you have to have trust and you have to have patience. Uh, you have to be enduring to be able to show love and affection affectionately. You can't just say, well, yeah, I do love you. No, love can be seen. It actually could be seen. When when somebody loves you, you know it. You know, they ain't got, you know, you don't have to have somebody tell you they love you all the time, which me, I'm very affectionate. My wife is not so much affectionate, but it's things that my wife do and I'm like, oh, she must love me to do that. You know, because <laughs> sometimes my request be like, dang, she actually did it. But uh, we want to go to Ephesians chapter 5. Chapter 5, and verse 1 through 3. And it says, Be your followers of God as their children. And the thing I want to focus on is that we want to be offspring. Because we are married to somebody. Like I said, there are saints here that's not physically married. That's not in it engagement with uh, another party but we are married to somebody it says and walk in love as Christ who who had loved us and had given himself for, for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savior and it's just like what I talked about people can be in an army and stand on the front lines and not have the life right with Christ but we'd be willing to die for somebody else that they don't even know but Christ we do know as saints Christ put his life on the line that way we will love one another, that we would take care of one another, and we will be offspring of God, and we'll be children to obey the things that Christ instructed us to obey in love. It's not, God's commandments are not grievous. Um, God's commandments save our souls. Uh, it helps us to love everybody else effectively the way they're supposed to be loved. Um, it helps us love our spouses. Um, just like I said, these basic traits uh, would definitely help us through our lives and in our marriages. All of us are married. I, I'm married. Like I said, I'm going to keep saying that because I know some of us that are not physically married, but we are all are married. And when we are doing these things, you know, we don't divorce ourselves from God because God never, God doesn't divorce us. We divorce ourselves. Mm -hmm. And like in any marriage, and, and when you're experiencing troubles and you're experiencing trials and, and tribulations in your marriage, somebody has gotten off path. And that's just what it comes down to somebody is not doing what God is instructed to do in the marriage to stay in the marriage. So it's important that as saints that we must open up the Bible. 
Saints, we, we must remember our commitment, you know. In any type of marriage, there's a commitment. So commitment, there's trust, there's other things that I didn't I didn't name, but there is a commitment that we have to have as saints uh, in this marriage if we want to still be in it. Verse 21 of Ephesians 5. It says, submitting yourselves to one another in a fear of God. And that is a very uh, key verse that I want to key in. Submitting yourselves. A lot of people have a problem with submitting themselves. It says, one to another. So in this marriage, it's give and take. It's not always brother Givens' way. It's not, it's not always sister Givens' way. It's give and take. You know, I pull, she pulls sometimes, or vice versa. When you don't do that, and you get off track from doing that, as the later part of that verse says, in the fear of God, then you just might as well just tell yourself, well, you don't fear God. You want to do what you want to do in this marriage. And you want to, you know, be the one who can uh, illustrate and can do everything without God. And you don't need God. That's what you're telling yourself when you are not willing to obey the, the small principles that God has instructed us to be as saints of God, to be in this marriage, to be in your physical marriage. When you don't want to submit yourself to one another, you're saying, I don't fear God. It just... It's just as plainly as I can put it. It says, why submit yourself to your own husband as to the Lord? It's not because of my own desires or your husband told you to. No, you do it to the Lord. You do it with, you do it with charity. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. It says, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject unto their own husbands. And us husbands, we're not off the track either. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also has loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it through the washing of the water by two words. So we are not off the track either. You know, the Bible tells us that no man has ever hated his own flesh. You know, that we adore our wives, and it's the same way we would take care of ourselves and how we adorn ourselves. It's the same way we should look at our wives spiritually. You know, we cannot rule over our wives with a uh, iron fist. No, we must love our wives. We must show charity to our wives. I'm skip to verse 25. I already, I already read that again, but I'm gonna read it again. Husband loves your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. So what it's saying is that we have to love our wives so much and this bride that we are that we're bid to be married to, which is in Christ. And all of the commitments that we made as saints of God, the commitment that we made to obey his son, Jesus Christ, to death, is the same way we should observe our physical marriages. And when we don't do that, we're telling ourselves that we just do not fear God. And remembering the things that pertain to life and godliness, that commitment I want to speak about, that commitment, that what we said we would do as saints. And I don't know, for me, I'm going to always remember my commitment um, as I was very um, blessed uh, to be sent to man and brother Pope. And I truly uh, thank that, that brother. I'm not worshiping him. I'm, I'm giving that brother honor uh, as a chosen vessel that I will always remember my commitment. I want to go to Romans 6. Um, I can always... Um, tell this story and, and to the death of me uh, on how the Lord saved me. And I don't know where you guys was when y'all made that commitment to serve the Lord in spirit and truth. Um, uh, when you made the commitment to be married to Christ. <clears throat> but I want each and every one of you, those of us by the sound of my voice, who are saints to remember your commitment to Christ. Remember your commitment to your marriage. When you stood before God and you told God through sickness and health to death through a part that you do. And I wanted to go to Romans 6, and I want to go to verse 3. It says, Know you not that so many of us that were baptized into Christ, were baptized into Jesus Christ, forgive me, were baptized into his death. That's the commitment that we made, saints. It says that, Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism unto death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also walk in newness of life. 
And it says, verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. It says, knowing this, that the old man is crucified, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So when we made that commitment to serve Christ, we made the commitment to be in this marriage, to be in this bond, that old person was supposed to die. So it's not that what Brother Samus wants to do all the time. I'm just using you, Brother. I'm just picking on you. It's not what Sister Johnson wants to do all the time. It's not what Brother Gibbons wants to do all the time. It's that the commitment that we made that we were serving the spirit and truth, that we were serving in sincerity, and that way. I always, in any old ways that we have, our attitudes, the things that uh, might make our significant other upset, you know, we made a commitment that, you know what, when I chose to be in this marriage, that those things would die. Now, as we are in the flesh, and there are things that do come up, I'm not perfect. Neither is anybody else in here in this room, you know, uh, saying that they are, but we are in the flesh and we do make mistakes. But when a mistake becomes blankly something that you just want to do out of your own free will, then you sin. Because the Bible tells us that if me, a man, make my brother to offend, it is sin to do it around him. So when you want to do things based on uh, your own agendas and the things that you know will make your significant other mad, the things that you know that will make Christ mad, that will void the commitment, you're sinning. And we want to go to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17 and 9. Jeremiah 17 and 9, we want to talk about the heart, because I haven't really touched on the heart too much. But we want to talk about the heart. The heart also plays a part in this as well. Because if you don't have love in your heart, then this commitment is voided. And who are you married to? Even in a physical sense. If you don't have love for your significant other, you don't have wife, love for your, uh, your husband or your wife, then whom are you married to? Because you, you cannot be married to Christ and not show those characteristics as well. You can't be in a marriage with Christ and be in a marriage physically and say that, well, I love my husband if you're not displaying the behavior that Christ has told us to display. Love, commitment, forgiveness, and intimacy. So we're going to go to Jeremiah 17. We're going to talk about the heart a little bit. Jeremiah 17 and verse number 9. It says, the heart is deceitfully, <clears throat> the heart is deceitfully of all things and is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Verse 10, it says, I, the Lord, search the heart and try the reins. It says, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruits of his doing. <clears throat> and that goes hand in hand with Matthew chapter 12. And I'm going to use Matthew chapter 12 to bring on the point. Matthew chapter 12. Verses 34 through 37. We talked about the heart. Now this is Jesus. He's dealing with some scribes in his time. And let's see what he says about their heart. And let's see uh, what the heart <clears throat> tells about an individual. Because nobody in here knows nobody's hearts. We don't. But God does. We can't get overworn on God. Verse 34 says, O generation of vipers. It says, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if there's things that you hate about, you say that you hate about your, your husband or wife, <clears throat> those things that you speak out of hearts, and that you're avoiding your commitment with Christ, the commitment that you said that you will be faithful unto death when you obey the gospel, when you was baptized, you said that that old person would be crucified with Christ. Galatians, I believe, is uh, 2.20. Nevertheless, not you live, but Christ that lives in us. So when you say evil things out of your heart towards your significant other, you're avoiding the contract that you instructed yourself to live by to be married, to be in this marriage. It says a good man out of the treasures of his heart <clears throat> bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the treasures of his, uh, and an evil man Treasures bring, I'm sorry, forgive me. And an evil man out of the evil treasures bringeth forth evil things. And Jesus tells us, But I say unto you, that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. It says, For by the words that shall be justified, and by the words thou shalt be condemned. So there are things that you might say 
that's in your heart that you say that's not right to your significant other can cause God to measure your heart. And you void the contract of being married or being in this marriage. And those are things, things that I, I would like to bring forth for us to really think about and take heed to those things and who we are married to because the basic instructions for marriage Christ outlined for us, we don't need, um, it's good to have godly counsel and brother, brother Folkin is a great counselor in marriage. He is, he's definitely helped me time before and I don't mind seeking counsel if I get off uh, in my walk. Uh, I'm definitely not above reproach and if somebody wants to counsel me to save my soul, I definitely would take heed but a lot of times that things can be solved in our marriages, things can be solved in this marriage if we just open up the word of God, you know. And the Bible talks about that some are going to depart from the faith. We know that. It tells us that uh, brother, sister is not under bondage in these cases. We know it tells us about that uh, in 1 Corinthians 7. Matter of fact, let's just go there. 1 Corinthians 7. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 7. And we know that God, he hates divorce. We do know that. But let's read what God has to say about some of the things that do partake in marriages that don't just quite work out. 1 Corinthians 7 and the verses um, 3, I want to start there. It says, Let the husband render unto his wife to do benevolence, love, affection, and likewise also the wife to her husband. When we talk about the do benevolence, it's the goodwill. It's not always the things that we think about in the flesh. It's just a goodwill. Like, my wife would make my lunch, you know. I would wash the dishes for my wife. Uh, she would put down the children. I would vacuum the living room. She would sweep the kitchen. It's the smallest things, the new but none of the things that we do to show our affection, the things that we do to show that even in our physical marriage, those are things that Christ would instruct us to do as individuals that will help us along the way, even to be faithful unto him. Because when you or anyone you know, get off track. What they're telling you is that they don't fear God. Like, for instance, I, I didn't want to bring this up, but we have so many <clears throat> brothers that's fornicating today. And they think because they're not physically fornicating by having online worship or the things that they do pertaining to life and godliness that's in error calling themselves doctors. Uh, you know, preacher emeritus, some of these words that they're using in the church, um, they you know, want to do all the beef-based things. You know, that's not that's not the bride that we're married to. So these brothers have got off track. And they have come away from the bride to to be in fornication with somebody else. That is not the, the bride of Christ. We don't do that in the Bible. Verse 15. So this is what will happen for those of us who, who do that. But if the unbeliever depart, let them depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us into peace. So if people want to deviate from the will of God, people want to deviate from God's basic simple instructions on how to be in a marriage the proper way, then the Apostle Paul tells us, by, inspired by God, that let them go. We have to let that individual go. And that's something that they will have to deal with in their heart when they go before God, because we're all going to go before God, and he's got, God is going to ask you, so why did you divorce? And he's going to know in your heart that you wanted to do something contrary to what he instructed you to do with your husband or wife. He's going to know that. You, we can't fool God. God knows everything. He's going to know that. No, one of y'all got off track. Who, who was it? Who was it? who caused the divorce, somebody got off track because if you follow the basic principles, I, I'm guaranteed you, there's no way it can fail. There's people be together 100 years and not even being in Christ because they stuck to love, they stuck to forgiveness, and they stuck to their intimacy. And they, can, they, they won't even possibly be in Christ, but they can do it. And people can be together for a long time. And it's, it's sad how we got saints of God who just, you know, forgive me, brother and sister. I know y'all been divorced, but it might not have been on y'all end. It might have been in that, that other, you know, person who's like, okay, well, look, at this particular time, you know, they might not have been ready to serve Christ and serve the truth like they was, or, or they might have said they was, but they actions is short. You know, they didn't show charity in their heart in, in any other situation, or they could have just been a cheater. 
They could have just been ching, 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 ching. And God said, let them depart. If that's what they want to do at that time, I'm going to free you from that bondage. And you could find somebody who's going to reverence you, who's going to love you the way I instructed them to love you. And that could have been what happened. But somebody got off. <laughs> somebody got off. And I want to go to, um, we want to talk about forgiveness. Now, I don't want y'all to get quiet on me on forgiveness, okay? And we're talking about forgiveness. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 17. Let's try to get through this. It says, Moreover, if thy brother should trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained a brother. Now, this is very important. Verse 17. And he and if he shall neglect to hear them. I'll forgive me. Forgive me. I'll skip verse 16. But if thou will hear thee, then take with thee two or three more. It says that in the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word may be established. Verse 17 is very important. And if thou shalt neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man or in public. And what the Lord is saying is the points I just brought up. When brothers are getting off point, getting off center of the will of God, and they're doing uh, the online worship, things that we cannot find in the scriptures. I know at the time they didn't have internet, but we have other scriptures that we can put together to show that we were supposed to come together and worship. When brothers are doing things contrary to the church, that word church there is the ecclesia. That is the called out. Those are the saints of God who obey the gospel. Those are the saved ones. Those who, if they continue in their walking, in their speech, they will make heaven their home. It says, tell it to the church. So when somebody is divorcing, not for a matter other than fornication, if you're divorcing, somebody has got off track. I guarantee it. Because somebody is not doing the will of God the way God have instructed us to show the charity and the love in our heart, to care enough about that individual to make that marriage work. And that is the same with us. If I want to bring an instrument in here, I am the one who got off track. Because God says that we admonish him. The songs and spiritual songs singing, making melody in our heart. Ephesians 5, I believe it's 18 through 19. I believe it is. But it's like, so when I want to do something of my will, that means I got off track. And I stopped doing the will of God. And when we're talking about forgiving, the Bible talks about seven times seven in a day. Now, that doesn't give us as men to be, you know, my wife likes to use the word douchebag. I think that's an appropriate word to say. <laughs> when we're talking about us men, and vice versa women too, this doesn't give us, I'm, I'm going to say this nicely, this doesn't give us reason to cheat. That seven times seven uh, 70 times 70 in a day that we should forgive our brother. This doesn't give us reason to cheat. Because Proverbs tells us, let's go to Proverbs. Let's see what it says. Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7 and verse will be number 5. It says, now I'm going to go back up to verse 4, forgive me. It says, say unto wisdom that thou art my sister, and call understanding thou king's me. It says, that they may keep from strange women and men, it says, from the stranger which flattered with her words. And this word stranger that he used, it's a foreigner. We know that Ephesians 2 and 19 tells us that we are no more foreigners. We're not foreigners at all in Ephesians 2 and 19. And it says profane. It uses the word profane in the Greek, the Hebrew text. And we know that we're not supposed to be partaking in vain babblings, as 1 Timothy 6.20 says. So, you brothers who can't seem to be faithful to your wife, you can't be bid to the marriage in the way Christ instructed us to be, it's you. 70 times 7 in a day doesn't give you an excuse to do that, because that's out of the will of God. So, we cannot be trespassers against God. We wrong God when we do that, when we are allowing people to 
partake in vain conversation, whether it be men or women, doing things that you're not supposed to do, especially when you have a wife or husband. We become profane. We become foreigners. And the scriptures tell us that we're not foreigners. And we trespass against God, so we don't get to be bid to the marriage. And we will be cast hand and foot into the out of darkness, and there be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We need to be really focused on in our daily walk, who are we married to? And I guarantee you, if we continue to focus on who we are really married to, everything else will work itself out. That's if you have faith. Reason why they mention faith, because you have to have that aspect if you're going to be in this marriage. I don't have to. I don't have to mention it because I said love, forgiveness, and intimacy. That commitment we made in our love for Christ is the commitment we should make in our daily walking in our fleshly marriages to make a successful marriage. Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Verses 22, and I'm going to try to read this as quickly as I possibly can. Saying, Jesus said this to him. We're talking about forgiveness. Now, we know we don't have, uh, you know, we just shouldn't be going out there cheating men and women. You know, just to say, okay, because they're supposed to give me 70 times, 70 times 70. No, that's, that's not a reason. And Jesus is going to break that down in Matthew 18, why that isn't so. So Jesus said it to them. I say not unto thee until seven times, but into 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of God, and he's going to explain. Therefore, the kingdom of God is likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his service. It says, and when he had began to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. Now, he owed him 10,000 talents. He says, but as for much as he had not to pay, the Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and the payment to be made. And that's the same thing what God would do to us. We don't want to get in line with God, and God will, will dress us up as a goat, and we will think we're sheep. And then when it, we stand before the judgment, he's going to tell you, y'all on the right, y'all on the left. <laughs> and he's going to tell you, all you goats, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You're going to be cast into out of darkness. But you thought you were a sheep because you went to church mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. It says, the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. So he's exercising, he's exercising grace and mercy. Then the Lord of his servant was moved with compassion. He was moved with love that we spoke about. He was moved with compassion and said, loose him and forgive him his debt. Now watch this. But the same servant went out and found one, one of his servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Now we have so much sin on us before we obeyed the gospel. I know I had. I had so much sin on me. And when I made the commitment to be in this marriage, uh, our Lord and Savior, and when he washed me from my sins, I had a lot. And he moved with compassion, and he did that for me. He said, but the same servant went out and found one servant, one of his uh, fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Now that's less than what I owed. Christ. And he said, he said, he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owe. And his servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me. That's what it means to show love, affection. And he says, And I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went to cast him into prison till he shall repay the debt. So his followers, so when his, his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told him to their Lord all that was done. He said, then his Lord, then his Lord, after that he had called him, said it to him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debt, just like God forgave us all our debt before we was members of the body of Christ. He says, because thou desired me, because you wanted to be bid to me, you wanted to be married to me. He says, Says not that I have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all which was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, even if from our hearts forgive not every one of his brethren their trespasses. And Christ has laid it out in just 
plain English as easy as I can try to lay it out for myself is that we have to show forgiveness in everything that we do as saints of God. We don't show forgiveness even in our marriage. Christ won't show forgiveness in his marriage to us if we are not going to show forgiveness to our significant others. And the last point I want to touch on is intimacy. I want to touch on intimacy, and intimacy is going to be very short because it's self-explanatory. Intimacy is a bond. It's a closeness. It's a bond between a wife and a husband. And we all have grown here. <laughs> we all are very much grown I'm going to use some words, and I'm going to keep it PG-13, but we want to go to Acts chapter 4, and we want to explain the intimacy that Christ requires from us as his bride, being in a marriage, and even the intimacy our wives requires from us, or vice versa, our husband requires from us. We're going to Acts chapter 12. Forgive me, forgive me, saints. Acts chapter 4, and the verses is 12 through 13. And this is Peter. He's speaking. Neither is salvation in any other. It says, For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other bride we can be saved through. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that these were un unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. Why? Because they were unlearned and ignorant? Because no. They spent time with Christ. I'm not going to knock schools. I really ain't because I've never been to Southwestern Christian College. I've never been to Abilene Christian College, and I don't knock those schools. Those are the ones who are, are staying with the doctrine. But I want you to listen to the last part of this verse, and, it, and it's going to explain the intimacy that we should all display in our lives. And it says, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. We have to spend the intimacy time with our husband. Being members, being married to the, be the bride of Christ, being married to whom, we have to show our significant other that intimacy. We have to spend time with them. We have to come together. That's what the word says. We have to be pleasing, as the scripture says, I'm keeping the PG-13. When you're showing intimacy, nobody wants to be in intimacy that's not pleasing. You know, it's like, it's just vain. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything for anybody if you're showing intimacy and affection and you, you don't get pleased from it. I'm just being PG-13. But that's what the scripture says. We have to show pleasing intimacy. We have to spend time with the God. And our times with the Lord, the times we take to study. The Bible says that Peter and John were unlearned and ignorant. It means exactly what it means. That they didn't go to school to study anything. They were unlearned and ignorant. They were fishermen. And they spent time with the Lord. They spent the intimacy required. We're going to go to Galatians as we come to a close. We're going to go to Galatians. We're going to see if, the, if intimacy is very important in this marriage. Galatians, in the chapter is 1, verses 10 through 12. And even the Apostle Paul says the same thing. For I do... For do I now persuade men or God? Do I please you or do I please God? Do I spend the intimacy with God? I want to be pleasing to God. Just like I want to be pleasing to my significant other, same with God. It says, or do I seek to please men? And it says, and yet if I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that this gospel which was preached of me is not after man. So Paul said, I didn't go to school either. No man taught me this. No man taught me how to have intimacy with God. No, God showed me how to have intimacy to be pleasing with him. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that comes by spending time with the Lord, having intimacy. Love, commitment we made, having forgiveness and intimacy is a recipe for a godly marriage. It's a godly marriage. The Bible's just broken down. We don't, I don't have to tell you about having trust. I don't have to tell you about uh, having faith. Because display these characteristics, you have to have that. You have to trust your significant other and showing the love that you show and showing the commitment that you show when you obey the gospel and you accepted, uh, you, you, you accepted the call, uh, 
those of us who have accepted the call, when you obeyed the gospel, you made that commitment. Think about your commitment, saints, that we made. On that very faithful day, I don't know what you was doing. I remember mine vividly. The commitment I made when I walked into West Virginia Church of Christ at the end of their service with Brother Pope, I remember that commitment that I said I was going to make. And you have the opportunity today to make that same commitment. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into Christ. We all are baptized into Christ. And it says that whether we be Jew or Gentiles, whether we be bond and free, and we have all been made to drink from into one spirit. One spirit. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28, 17. He tells them that, that we should, um, forgive me, 28, 19. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, I think, is what a lot, a lot of our brethren, they kind of miss this. It is very uh, instrumental in our teaching. It says, teaching them to deserve all things for so I command you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even to the end of the earth. Amen. And that's one of the things that our brothers are so focused on. Um, we talked about on the Zoom. I, we have a lot of our brethren that are so focused on baptizing. you just getting you in, and that's it. That's why we have a lot of brothers just closing the door. That's all they want to do. They don't do the second part of what Jesus said. You've got to continue to teach them to observe all the things. Now, it's all the things that we, we when we stand before Christ and in our physical marriage, and we say, well, I do. I do promise to do this, and I promise I can't remember vows that, you know, I got married to the courthouse. <laughs> but the things that we promise to do, I love and So once I get in this marriage, do I just say, oh, I don't have to do anything else. I married you. That's it. So there's nothing else that needs to be done. That's not what the Bible tells us to have a godly marriage. And we know in Acts, it's my favorite scriptures. One of my, one of my, my favorite passages is when we're talking about the conversions. Acts chapter 8 and verse 36 and 38. And giving the plan of salvation for anyone here that uh, needs to be saved, uh, children, nephews alike, uh, they're very understanding of the word. They ask a lot of questions. Even if there's saints here that's gotten off track, they need prayer. You don't have to tell us what you need to be prayed for. You can just say, "Hey, I need prayer, and I want to honor my commitment that I made to Christ." You know, and I need prayer. And I need the saints, the prayers of the righteous, are better than nothing. I need the saints to pray for me mm -hmm. that I could could get back in line and remember the commitment that I made with Christ. Philip is dealing with the unit. It says, verse number 36, it says, As they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the unit said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the unit, and he baptized him. Baptism is the only thing that puts you in this marriage. Only thing mm -hmm. to be in this marriage. You could be in other worldly marriages, other loose lemon women all you want to, Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, but that is not the bride. Mm -hmm. And the Bible tells us that we should be faithful unto death. Romans 2.10, that we should be faithful unto death. We could, should continue to still teach and preach the things could turn to life and God, <laughs> even after we've made that commitment, even in our physical marriages. I still have to continue to make sense to give us happy. You know, I still have to show love. I still have to show forgiveness. And I still have to show intimacy in doing the things that's pleasing to Sister Gibbons. The same thing, Christ. Christ expects nothing lesser than what we're supposed to do, even in our physical marriage. And if you believe that with all your heart, you may be saved. You may be saved, but only this way. Not no prayer, no confession. Not no dream in the middle of the night. There's nothing nobody can say outside of what Christ has already instructed us to do that we may be saved. You know, Grandma... Grandpa telling us to pray, put our hand over our heart, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That doesn't get you in this marriage. Mm -hmm. you, know? you know, how would you like to be the unit? You know, going to go tell somebody, man, this guy came out of nowhere and baptized me. I was already coming from the church. I already thought in my heart I was saved. But then he preached to me the gospel. As we was, as he was just coming out of nowhere, I was in the chariot. And then after he baptized me, he just disappeared. I ain't seen him no more. Wouldn't people think you a fool mm -hmm. <laughs> telling that story? <laughs> Amen. If you believe in all that, if you believe that with all in your heart, you may be saved. Those who will not, like I said, if you need prayer, um, you don't have to acknowledge to the church what that particular thing was. You can stand and be acknowledged as we stand and uh, sing heaven's invitation. When the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. When the Savior Somewhere 
listening for my name.